Um, so I think this, this will be uh, a little bit more of an open conversation. I would, I'd love to hear a lot from, from the, the panelists here on these, these core questions we have here on the voting landscape today, um, how groups such as youth, racial minority populations, minority populations generally, non-English speaking have been engaged and or like engaged by either side. And then we can end with a discussion of Shelby County. So um, I think there's a word missing from that one. Uh, what does the voting landscape look like today? Um, I can start with this one. Um, you know, I, I would say that there are, for presidential elections, we have, I would say, some um, areas of the country, and Wisconsin is one of them, that we see a lot of voter turnout. Um, you know, it's gotten much better in terms of uh, people being able to um, exercise their right, right to vote. But I would also argue that, um, and I think both the panelists have said, you know, I think alluded to this, that there continues to be um, a lot of efforts towards voter suppression. So it might not be the poll tax. It might not be um, a difficult literacy test, but there are other ways in which um, individuals have, uh, are, you know, are uh, left from or kind of removed from the process of voting. And I think one of the ones that kind of comes up to mind immediately is one that Rob and I just participated in, which was uh, watching what happened in the April election here in Milwaukee, where we went from over 100 vo voting sites to five in-person voting sites during a pandemic, um, where it became very difficult to do absentee voting. And so thinking through the ways in which our government and institutions and structures, you know, make decisions that limit when and how people can vote, um, I think is still something that, you know, like happens too often. And as we think about what's going to happen in November, when we're still going to be in the middle of a pandemic, um, it's, I think, one of those moments where you have to ask yourself, like, what do people actually value? Does our government, do the people in elected office value my right to vote? And how are they trying to make it easier for me? Um, and in what ways can I fight for that, right? I think the League of Women Voters and other organizations like that are really focused on the idea that we need to continue to fight for the enfranchisement of individuals. We haven't actually been able to, you know, get there for everybody. And one quick point. I know that one of the core strategies of voter mobilization, whether that's left, right, nonpartisan, whatever, is creating plans to vote with individual voters. And if, as you're describing, I mean, that, that election we had, the April election, it was like down to the last minute, right? Like we did before. Like, yeah, it was like, our, and so I think how disruptive the um, the last minute, like there's sort of whether you're trying to do it or not, there's a voter suppression residue if you're yes. if you're yanking the rules back and forth because people have plans to vote that you know if on the day of voting doesn't look like what you're planning, you stay home, right? So well, you know. and I would argue we were talking about this during the pre session as well. Like I think the confusion is you know purposeful, right? Like there's people who are really smart who are like I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Um, who are paying attention. And so if you're the kind of person who normally votes the day of and, you know, like people have lots of things going on in their lives. So to not realize that you needed to three weeks ago send in your absentee ballot, I think is, you know, obviously there's just a group of individuals who that particularly harms and they tend to be younger. They tend to be uh, people of color. And so it's like this kind of swath of individuals who continually have to fight for those, um, that, those opportunities. You know, Adam, you mentioned President, President Obama's eulogy. And one of the key, among the many key statements he made was the, you know, today the, the, the real challenge is that there's so many obstacles that it encourages folks not to partake in the voting process at all. And that is its own type of voter suppression to make it confusing, to, to make it seem out of reach, to make it such that folks will sort of opt out because of the confusion, because of the challenges. That, that uh, apathy or that encouraged um, apathy is 
a core tactic today. And, you know, there's a, there's a famous document. I don't know if you all know this one, but it said when government becomes destructive to those ends, you know, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish. And, you know, when our government is, is intervening to our detriment, that rises to the level of human rights abuses. It's not only uh, abuse on our, uh, of our civil rights, but it's a, it's a broader conversation around human rights. To what extent are we discouraged from taking part in a political process through voting, which is again, the primary means by which we get to have a com conversation with our elected officials. I got, a, I got a puppy over here that wants to play with me. <laughs> You know, I want to add to that um, to say that I, I would love to explore further how the young in particular, and not just the young, the younger voter rather, uh, um, perhaps has disconnected democracy from, from voting uh, or politics rather. You know, there's many of them are kind of sick of the politics that they see that that's really not representing them, but um, and and I think voting is some is in part connected to politics, but the bigger piece around democracy, you know, is sort of gets left off as a result. And I really think the two have to be further merged in people's minds to um, because younger voters are known to historically vote less often than than older citizens. And so I really think we've got to merge the two further. You know, my work with the League of Women Voters as a nonpartisan organization is really to, you know, continue to educate, educate, educate. Um, and that's important. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to switch if it's okay to, um, you know, I, I just want to highlight a little feature around the, a feature around the Latinx voters. And I'll use the word Latinx or Latino, whichever uh, people prefer. Uh, and that is to say, you know, now there are 32 million, estimated 32 million Latino voters in the United States. Um, and knowing that the Latino population in the United States is, uh, the median age is younger than other, most other populations. And it's, so it's gonna, con it'll continue to be a larger part of the electorate in the future. We really have to, um, in, with all groups, figure out how to best engage them so that they do, I get out uh, to vote, but understand the issues that are before them as they make their decisions around to vote. Uh, our group with the League of Women Voters of Milwaukee County is El Comité por el Voto Latino, the Latinx voter outreach team. So we are really uh, pouring out um, translated information. Uh, I would say that the majority of Latinos in Milwaukee are English speaking, but there are plenty that uh, our, have primary, their primary language is Spanish. And we decided early on that regardless of the percentage, um, there is a code word for connection, and that is having the um, material provided in both languages, having it in Spanish. Um, su voto es su voz is something that came back out of the 1960s out of Texas. And that was to say to people, hey, your vote is your voice. And so we, we sort of reclaimed that uh, here in the 2020 to say we're using that to um, reach out to our historical past and say presently, you know, there is so much work to do around uh, engaging Latinos in, in terms of voting. So um, I just want to highlight the fact that, and we think about here in um, current, his, current times, that our, our community really has to be engaged regardless of race, gender, we really have to get out and support one another um, to understand uh, what's involved in voting. So I'm really pleased that the league is involved in this, but they're involved um, in, with all communities to get out the vote and to provide forums for discussion around, you know, what does democracy look like? I, can we take, Ben shared with us one of the questions that was posed from Bethany Perkins on Facebook. And I think that's, a, it's, you, you, you touched on a little bit in your last comments there, but uh, Bethany points out, based on the fact that the propaganda we were looking at feels so relevant today, what do you say to change the mind of a citizen who doesn't feel their vote could possibly change anything? Because if it could, it would have been changed by now. So that's maybe a, a different isotope of the question you were just discussing um, that, you know, like, 
frankly, yeah, when people are apathetic or indifferent, um, I feel like a lot of times that's rooted in sanity. <laughs> and um, so how do you, how do you uh, compel someone like that who I think is taking a, what I think is a really logical, um, you know, logical point of view of saying, well, if it's, if it's this messed up, if I use, uh, you know, the logic of just, you know, regression and go backwards, what's the point of me getting involved today? You, you know, let me, let me start with that because I, I, I want to, I'm going to respond using some of the research Paru and I have done on the voter ID laws. Um, uh, there's a case out of Indiana which sets in motion and provides the legal precedent for voter ID laws. And many of these policies are, as Paru mentioned earlier, colorblind. Um, however, in the state of Indiana, out of which this case arises, uh, from 1990 to 2000, the Latino population in the state had, had increased by several hundred thousand. And while that voter ID law was indeed colorblind, it was clearly intended to attend to the emerging population of Latino voters. It was clearly intended to attack and restrict those, those voting uh, options and, and uh, access to the ballot box. And, and my response to that question is, um, if indeed that we know now for certain that these attacks on voting are uh, designed and intended to undermine democracy, that should piss people off enough to stay fo mm -hmm. focused in the process. Because these, these efforts are designed to limit our democratic exchange and our democratic uh, voice, our, our voice in what democracy is really supposed to mean. And, and these laws are specifically targeted in such a way to uh, really and truly um, maintain uh, a level of right, white supremacy such that Latino and black voters uh, continually lose their their political voices and their, their, their political voices then become almost muted in the face of these policies. And so my my response to that question is folks who are listening in or, or folks who might stumble across these these uh, notions, you should you should really be pissed off. You should be angry at your your political leadership. And, and, and it's largely a Republican project, but be, be pissed off at Democrats, too, you know, because your, your, your voice, your contribution to this experiment in democracy is valuable. And we see how important it is. And as a, uh, a number of people have said, if, if voting wasn't important, why is it that so many folks in political power do all they can to limit your access to the, to the, to the voting box? If it's not important, why is there so many mechanisms designed to restrict your options and your access? Thank you. That's good. All right, that was, this, is a, this is a competition now. Who's got the best statement to someone? Why they should go? <laughs> and another I thing, just, Adam. <laughs> you had your chance, Rob. It's far as time. <laughs> well, I was just going to add, it reminded me, Rob reminded me of the time that we were, um, watching uh poll watching in um 2012 there were definitely young people there who were out because they were told they can't vote and they were like you know i think there is that mobilization factor of being you know like told you can't do that and feeling like hey you can't t you know you can't uh take that right away from me and i think about that video of john lewis and i mean people have literally sacrifice their lives to get us to this place now. So I would hope that young people, I understand, I, I feel the same apathy, I think, as others. I think it's not just young people who feel this moment of what's, what's going on and how am I going to make a difference? But I think, um, you know, like, I think to have, and like, to have some, a little bit of a long view and hope that together, like, we can make, you know, I, I guess there are changes, important changes that are being made, and some, I study mostly state and local government, and I think about the number of women and women of color and people of color running for office at that level, and I am excited because I think there is going to be some significant change in those spaces, and, um, and so those, those, you know, names are on those ballots too. So it's not just about, you know, who's running for president, but these things really, I think, matter in your day-to-day -day life in ways that, um, you know, 
decide like how much tuition you're going to pay and things like that. And so you want to be involved if you're a young person and making and being part of that decision making. Yeah, I think I agree, you know, that, that, uh, that, that there's, there are reasons to be hopeful uh, with what we're seeing with our young people. I think there is also a lot of apathy with our young people and not just our young people, but, and I think there's kind of a narrow view about their role. And I think our, I think for educators, our role is to expand that so that they see a much broader, a bigger picture, that historical picture, which is, you know, being offered today. And, and then I think you, when you have that broader context, you're saying, okay, this isn't about just this particular vote. I'm going to vote for this candidate that is the lesser of two evils. And, you know, I either I won't vote or I will vote, but I'm not happy about it. But expand it to, you know, there's a lot more involved here. And so, yes, I am doing this, for, you know, with holding my nose, but there's a bigger picture that I am supporting as a result of this. You know, I think one tactic that I've been seeing lately that's really sophisticated and kind of quiet, Black Leaders Organizing Community has been hosting forums with people, but that also just get into what are the basics of some of the down ballot jobs that are done? Like when you get that ballot and you see register of deeds or you see, you know, <laughs> comptroller, it's almost like a joke. Like, but when you start learning about what those things do, it's like, whoa, like that's actually really important. And then I think um, uh, to a company that Liberate MKE, which is another local group that's working, they, they've started finding entry points for people to start influencing these civic processes and made their voice heard directly within budgetary processes. So I think maybe that's like, so I guess in some ways, like, yes, the winds of apathy are strong, but like in a weird way, because so many people have been left out of civic processes for so long, there's actually that, like your, your voice can be that much louder, <laughs> you know, like when you start yeah. using it, it's like, because there's been this atrophy of the muscle, the civic muscle, like now, like it doesn't require that much muscle to win the arm wrestling match. So. Well, and you know, Adam, you bring up a good point with block and liberate MKE and all voting is local, you know, legal women, voters, ACLU, the, what I'm most excited by is the fact that so many of these groups are working at a grassroots level. I mean, you have folks in, in the spirit of Freedom Summer and other uh, eras where we saw that grassroots mobilization. We, we now have, I think, more so than ever, a, a time ever that I've witnessed, a, a, a population of folks who are educated not only about presidential elections, but state and local elections. And that's because of the grassroots education yep. and the grassroots mobilization that's happening that that is that can't be uh uh overstated in terms of its importance that uh in between elections folks are knocking on doors and raising awareness and educating it's it's an ongoing civic process and you know it's civic education in its purest sense you know so thanks to those organizations right on we need that I mean, that even too, I mean, just to that point, it's, it's a part of voting where like, I think my last aldermanic election was decided by less than 100 votes. Um, right. You know, like, like, so if someone does very close. Yeah, <laughs> especially the, 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 lo the lower local ones, right? Your, right? your supervisors, your aldermen, your, I mean, sometimes like, yeah, like it, like you, you can be the vote, <laughs> like, or you could be close. Right. Or even if you talk to like five of your friends, you can make a big influence. So we, we've been moving through a lot of different spaces. Um, are there any, I mean, just for Eloisa and Paru, I just wanted to offer to you, you both, this has been sort of a, a wide ranging conversation through history and, 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 and the present. Um, are there other sort of like core ideas uh, that center your work that you do in the community that you'd want to share with people that you feel like they really need to know sitting in, in this moment? Well, I, I know that um, that we have, a, I feel that the, with the Latinx community, it's been, it's neglected until it's election time overall. And that, you know, the more we have an ongoing relationship 
with the different communities, bilingually, being culturally uh, competent in our approaches, is, is going to better engage uh, the Latino voter. And so just want to highlight the fact that uh, we have a lot more information in Spanish by the legal women voters um, available to the community and it's statewide. So please make use of that. Um, so I think that that's part of it. The other thing is, is that I really think um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking for opportunities to really connect with the Gen Z population um, and to help them to um, navigate uh, the electoral process. I don't know fully how to do that. And I know that there's been plenty of research out there to figure that out too. There's a lot of surveys where we're beginning to understand it. Um, the other thing to mention is, you know, we're in the midst of this pandemic and we had to do things differently to reach people. Talk about grassroots. Our grassroots was going out to the community, um, community by community working, and now we're doing it more virtually. And that was quite a, you know, talk about slamming on the brakes and doing something different. Holy cow. I mean, a number of us didn't even know how to use Zoom. Um, and that, that kind of reflects our age. I just talked about myself, um, you know, how to reach people. And so we have to figure out new ways to reach people, uh, especially our young people, and how to do that, I think is so critical. As a millennial that struggles to understand Gen Z, I'm sure someone's going to come up with a TikTok the vote campaign that will be so lame that it'll make voting cool. <laughs> I agree. I hope so. <laughs> you know, my, my neighbor, my neighbor's dog, it's my buddy, Toby over here, but my neighbor's back in, and we're, she's, she's chronicling the confusion that we just talked about. And again, this is an informed voter. And, and when, when she saw that we were on the webinar, we, we had a short conversation when I muted about these very issues, the exact thing we're talking about. Here's a very educated and engaged citizen who is still trying to figure out the mechanics of our voting process. Yeah. Yes. And it brings us back to President Obama's eulogy again. Like these are, these are practices and mechanisms that have to be undone. And until they are undone, we, we have nothing at our disposal except the grassroots mobilization that Eloise is talking about. Our, our political leadership is, is failing us in the most democratic, um, uh, the, most, the most significant component to the democratic process to where folks who are engaged are still trying to figure this out. It's what we do on the webinars, real time, right? <laughs> so I say join, join as many organizations as you can to learn more. Adam mentioned a few organizations. Um, you know, this, this particular um, session right now is an opportunity for us to learn. I just, you know, go and find the information and join and be a part of the change that we need so desperately in our community. And don't forget, there's an election next Tuesday. Um, so, you know, opportunities to, to Adam's point, to be involved in, you know, local races as well. And I guess I would be remiss not to encourage people who really want to see change to also consider running for office. Um, to uh, Rob's point earlier of protest to politics, I think my, I, I'm excited to see the Black Lives Matter activists running and winning office right now. Um, and again, that kind of representation matters in ways you know, like that we see kind of play out as we watch what's happening in Congress right now, but it can really make a significant difference. And there's a lot of local offices that could use uh, highly motivated young people running for those offices and making a change so absolutely it's their future you know is they, they've got to be willing to engage in the process so that they craft the future that they want look up the salaries seriously some of the uh, actually not all of them county doesn't get paid that well but aldermen and people working in city government they get paid pretty well I just want to say my last is to thank every all the volunteers that are out there working to promote uh, voter access. You know, it's it's the um, variety of groups out there. I'm so proud of their um, efforts over time to really get out the vote to educate the public, and I thank them all for doing that. Canvassing is God's work. It's very difficult and very important, <laughs> and can be yes. very. <laughs> Cool. 
great. Can I just add one last screed before we finish here? I'm just sitting on my front porch. I got a package here from Amazon Prime. Sitting in August 5th of 2020, the idea that we can't organize nationwide uh, mail-in voting when I can order uh, 250 sleeping pills from wherever and it's delivered <laughs> to my doorstep and I get several different notifications that it's coming and that I have it. And it's like, how well did they work? It's, it's some weird dystopian science fiction futuristic world we live in that I can buy anything I want and have it in two days, but we're gonna claim that we can't do uh, mail-in voting or like we don't have the infrastructure to do mail-in voting. That, yeah, like, that's, all, right? like, that's a choice. That's a choice that people, like they want you to believe that it's not possible. But they're making well, that, that choice. We don't have a day off of work to vote in this moment is also absurd. Rob you know, can buy a doggy bed for his neighbor <laughs> and get it delivered in two days. Two days. But we, but we want to imagine that we can't do mail-in voting. No. I mean, it's right. utterly ridiculous. And of course, all of that we know is, again, uh, political decisions intended to limit those who engage in the political process. Exactly in a so-called democracy.